This is Jim Minion from Two Loose Screws. I'm listening to Barbecue Central. So to get that perfect barbecue, you use wood. Are you sure it's safe? Whatever. We put the lighter fluid on, strike the match, and... Should we call the fire department? That might be a good idea. Good evening and welcome to the really big Barbecue Central show. This is the show that talks about all things important to the world of barbecue and grilling, broadcasting live and direct from the barbecue capital of the North Coast, Cleveland, Ohio. It's also the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame city. I'm your program host, Greg Rempe. Happy to have you aboard on your Tuesday evening. Two ways to get in touch with the show tonight. If you want to do it, it's a toll-free call, 877-448-0433. You can also email the show at any point if you want to. Greg at the BBQ Central Show.com. Everything else you want to find out about the show, you can do it at the website, the BBQ Central Show.com. Big show planned tonight, and here's what's happening. Coming up in about 13 minutes from now, Melissa Cookston from Yazoo's Delta Q will be joining us doing a little lead up to this weekend's Memphis in May. She's going for the second consecutive win three in the last four years. She's done a two of three years, so a three of the last four years for overall champion. So always look forward to conversations with Melissa. Also the first ever Kingsford Invitational winner last year down in Bell, Bell Missouri. 35 past the hour of 9 o'clock. Horse racing expert Harry DeHorse makes his way back in talking about the Preakness. That will also be going on. This coming weekend, busy weekend between barbecue and horse racing. Who knows? You should be barbecuing horses is what you should be doing. Second hour, 14 past, Andy Husbands from Team IQ Barbecue. He is also a chef and owner of Tremont 647 and Sister Sorrell in Boston, Massachusetts. He has teamed up again with the pitmaster of IQ, Chris Hart, and has done another outstanding cookbook. It was Wicked Good Barbecue. Now it's Wicked Good Burgers. So we're going to be talking to him about that book. A lot of burger cookbooks coming out all of a sudden. 35 past 10 o'clock, Bruce Pryor is going to be joining me. We're going to be talking about his new invention called the Barbecue Dragon or BBQ Dragon. Have you seen this? Quickly Google it. You'll see what I'm talking about. And uh, I don't want to say I was a little apprehensive about doing this interview, but he was persistent. And I told him, look, you know, I'm probably going to be coming uh, at this in... I want to say a negative fashion, but a a what is the value added perspective? You know me, sales guy. So I want to know what the win is for me, and if he can sell it to you, sell it to you. That's fine. So there you go. Melissa Cookston, Harry DeHorse, Andy Husbands, Bruce Pryor, all locked and loaded for tonight. Since you're watching the show right now, or maybe you're listening to it on your smart device or on some internet-based radio or whatever the case may be, blast off an email or make a Facebook post or tweet it out, whatever you do there on the social media. Let everybody know you're watching the show. Uh, If you are watching it, direct them to OutdoorCookingChannel.com. If you're listening, BBQCentralShow.com, TheBBQCentralShow.com. Download uh, some apps like a TuneIn Radio on your smartphone. You can get it across all platforms. You can stream it right in your car, or if you're just sitting on the couch or whatever, you can do it right there. Or don't forget, you can watch the show live on Roku as well. If you go to Best Buy or if you go to any store that's got an electronics, typically they'll have some type of a Roku player there. If they don't, just go to Roku.com, R-O-K-U, Roku.com. A fun way to consume the show. And uh, again... If you have Roku, you have to go to the App Store, I believe is what it is, and then you download Outdoor Cooking Channel, and there is a live stream option, and you're able to catch the show live right now, which you know it seems like almost 100 or so people are doing uh, on top of all of the other listeners and watchers that we're getting from week to week as well. So just uh, another platform to watch the show. All right, I want to make an announcement. I've been getting a lot of email about this. I want to set the record straight right now. First and foremost, Charles Ramsey will not be, sorry, will not be appearing on this show currently. Again, many people have emailed, called, asking if I was going to book him. Now, look, while I admit 
He would be great for sound bites and video. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to say he wouldn't fit in around here, but I don't know if he technically fits the mold of what is happening around here. And of course, I could be way off. And to be honest, I really have no way to contact this guy. And just because he mentions the word ribs in you know a pretty important news conversation doesn't mean that he is going to be on the show, right? I mean, come on now. For those who have uh, no idea what I'm talking about, by the way, Charles Ramsey is the guy that has been credited with helping Amanda Berry, Gina DeJesus, and oh, what's that other girl's name? Michelle, Michelle Knight. Escape captivity. They have literally been being held captive for 10 years, like three miles away from their homes here on the west side of Cleveland. So in case you have been living under a rock, uh, this is the guy who has been on every show imaginable, and rightly so, and he can spin a yarn like no other. The dramatic pauses are second to none. Plus, he looks like he could go off at any point. So TV stations, radio stations uh, just are gobbling this guy up uh, any way they can get him. So am I saying that he would not be welcome on the show? Absolutely not. Would love to have him get a rib recipe from him uh, or, you know, some other type of uh, outdoor live fire cooking recipe or just kind of, you know, shoot the shoot the bull with him. But maybe at this time, phone only, Charles. Phone only. But look, in the final review, while Charles Ramsey is the it thing right now, my favorite is still Sweet Brown. Now, if you aren't familiar with Sweet Brown, luckily for you, I do happen to have a clip of what has made her an internet sensation long before Charles Ramsey's use of testicles and dramatic pauses. I submit to you, Sweet Brown. One resident describes her horrifying experience when she first realized the complex was on fire. Oh, no. Hold on a damn minute. Hold on. All right. Try this again. One resident describes her horrifying experience when she first realized the complex was on fire. Well, I woke what? up to go is this, give me a Is this coming pie. through? Then I thought somebody was barbecuing. I said, oh, Lord Jesus. Then I ran out. I didn't grab no shoes or nothing, Jesus. I ran for my life. And then the smoke got no. me. I got bronchitis. <laughs> Ain't nobody got time for that. Low Wait, audio. Are you telling me? Fire. Sounds like crap. Oh, I think I had this whole thing. Uh... Wait a second. Damn it. Well, this is terrible. Terrible news. Why is it not dumping into my uh, to my mix here? Hold on. Hold on. Let me try this again. One resident describes her horrifying experience when she first realized the complex was on fire. Well, I woke up to go get me a cold pop. And then I thought somebody was barbecuing. I said, oh, Lord Jesus, it's a fire. <laughs> Then I ran out. I didn't grab no shoes or nothing, Jesus. I ran for my life. And then the smoke got me. I got bronchitis. Ain't nobody got time for that. That's what I'm talking about. Which has then inspired this potential controversy. Do you like this hammer? Get that big stuff out of here. Or do you like this hammer? Ain't nobody got time for that. This one? Or this one. Ain't nobody got time for that. You weigh in and let me know which hammer works best. Also, uh, so that's Sweet Brown. Now, before we head off the first break, uh, last week I was incorrect when I said that BBQ.about.com was the most popular barbecue and grilling website destination on the Internet. Uh, the Experian Hitwise report specifically stated that BBQ.about.com got more search engine clicks than AmazingRibs.com and a number of other websites. Uh, that is not a measure of most popular, nor did it say anything about popularity uh, that was given in that report. So if there was any confusion last week about who has the most popular website or anything like that, uh, that's all that report said. Uh, that was my error saying that said the most popular, but that's exactly uh, what this report specifies is 
uh, search engine clicks. I'm not a bar, uh, I'm not a website nerd or anything like that. I don't know if uh, people, you know, whatever. Just want to make sure that I clear that up because uh, look, it's very important to Meathead to be uh, most popular. And uh, he has got all of the uh, statistical data analysis uh, to say that he's most popular. So if you ever have any questions, just ask him. He'll forward it along with expedient hopes and uh, express free mail with all the empirical data as well. There you go. What do you think about that sweet brown? Ain't nobody got time for that. Uh, No, that's right. Oh, that's right. It's a soundtrack. All right, uh, Melissa Cookson coming up here in just a couple minutes. Folks, let me talk to you quickly about Tasty Licks Barbecue Supply. Trusted online retailer and longtime supporter of this show. I just spoke with Fred a few days ago, and he wanted me to make sure that I let you know all about this stuff, right? Tasty Licks now carries Komodo Joe cookers, Meadow Creek cookers, spices, sauces, and accessories. Much of these items are in stock and ready to ship to you directly. Have you been looking for Oakwidge, Oakwidge, Oak Ridge brines and rubs? Have you been looking for the complete line of Plowboys rubs and sauces? How about the Smoke on Wheels products? Tasty Licks has them all. Of course, you know by now that Tasty Licks is also your Big Green Egg headquarters, including many items for the Big Green Egg that you can't get anywhere else. And all of these Big Green Egg items are in stock. Also, Tasty Licks Barbecue Supply, now carrying Harry Sue's new chicken rub. This particular rub is the same one that helped him win eight grand championships last year, as well as being the KCBS Team of the Year in the chicken category. Now, maybe you're looking for injections. Tasty Licks Barbecue carries all of the heavy hitters here as well. Butcher's Barbecue, Cosmos Q, every type of barbecue guru and their associated accessories. Tasty Licks is a green mountain grill pellet dealer as well. And as Fred says, right here on the show, they provide classes to the public. Fred teaches most of them himself. He is rather successful on the competition circuit. Uh, but he does a lot of backyard classes, and he also gets in some of the top pit masters from the competition circuit as well. Most recently, Harry Sue, but he's also had Dan Hickson from Three Eyes and uh, Todd Johns from Plowboys last year, always flying in the heavy hitters at least once or twice a year. And attention teams, Tasty Licks is your competition headquarters as well. All supplies for competition teams, pans in different sizes, aluminum trays, gloves, thermometers, turn-in boxes for practice, Make this your one-stop shop. TastyLicksBBQ.com is the place to go. So head on over now. Enjoy the videos that Fred puts up on his page there. They're very entertaining. When you order, drop Fred a line that you heard him here on this show. Let him know that you like his support of the show. It's appreciated. And again, that website, TastyLicksBBQ.com. That's TastyLicksBBQ.com. All right, when we come back, it's Melissa Cookston. We're going to be talking about Memphis and May, among other things. Huge announcement. Get on the Twitters right now. Tell everybody you know, Melissa Cookson is getting ready to drop a huge announcement. I'm not kidding when I say that. Could be huge. It's going to be huge. Stick around. We'll be right back. Broadcasting live from the Barbecue Central Radio Network Studios in Cleveland, Ohio. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Radio Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rampey. All right, we are back. 877-448-0433, 877-448-0433, Greg at the BBQ Central Show.com. Uh, my first guest tonight, one of the top circuit <laughs> today. Jeez, that was loud. Let me refrain from you uh, hearing that in your ear while I can. Uh, this coming weekend, they are going for their second overall Memphis in May win in as many years. Uh, two out of the last three, which should make... A three in total. They are riding a three-year win streak in Whole Hog at this event as well and has uh, really one of the most successful restaurants in her stable as well. Let's go ahead and race over to the hotline and welcome back a friend of the show, Melissa Cookston, pitmaster of Yazoo's Delta Q. Melissa, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Greg? I'm doing absolutely fantastic, Melissa. Always appreciate you making time for the show, especially on a weekend that is upcoming, probably one of the biggest events that you guys are uh, typically competing in during the course of the year now. 
Definitely, yeah. It, Memphis and May is definitely my Super Bowl. Um, you know, first Memphis style cooks, Memphis and May's where it's at. So, big weekend, as we've mentioned already five different times in six seconds, Melissa. Memphis and May, uh, as I said, one of the biggest events that teams look to enter and then, of course, win. As I mentioned in the intro, Jesus has won it twice already, looking to grab three and repeat on top of that. You know, from a competition side of things, how do you prepare for this event to make sure that you and the team are hitting on all cylinders to give your chance or to give yourself the best chance at repeating? You know, Greg, typically in years past, you, you always want to get some practice in, especially with whole hog, because it's not something you can just cook in the backyard, you know, to uh, like you can chicken or brisket or something like that. So typically you want to do some contests to warm up. Unfortunately, I have not been able to cook any this year. <laughs> not, not at all. Well, aside from obviously the restaurant, but completely different. I'm sorry? I said you've been cooking in the restaurant, but I mean, that's like a completely different animal. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, we cook about 8,000 pounds a week in the um, Memphis store and about 6,000 pounds in the North Carolina store. So I've got plenty of meat going on, (laughs) just not comp-style meat. All right, so maybe a little bit different of a scenario going into this year than it has been in years past. What kind of a mindset do you guys have to take at this point in order to, you know, get that game face on and and make sure that you're hitting on all cylinders? Yeah, you know, I mean... I've been cooking whole hogs for 16 years now. So, you know, pretty much any time we get to a comp, whether it's the first or the last of the season, it's pretty much auto dry for us. Um, You know, so I'm just going to go do what I do and cross my fingers, hope for the best. I now have the uh, Gregory B. Mojo on my side. (laughs) Let me call in. Um, You know, and, you know, Memphis in May, you have to have a good product, but there's a lot of luck involved with that too. I mean, it's, it's about what blind table you hit. I mean, there's so many factors involved. So, you know, you, you just got to hope for the best. Melissa Cookson joining me here on the show, pitmaster of Yazoo's Delta Q. A couple of different websites to check out. Yazoo's Delta Q, that's the uh, letter Q, dot com. And then Memphis BBQ CO, Memphis BBQ Co. dot com. Uh, if you want to check them out here while we're talking. If I could just for a second here, Melissa, let me kind of back out of all the in-depth competition stuff there's a percentage of the listening audience that maybe isn't as keen to the competition circuit like some of us are are you able to kind of give us a a thumbnail sketch of what this event is about how you qualify to get into the finals and then you know how that's judged to come up with an overall winner sure you know memphis and may is a strictly pork competition um in normal smaller contests you're able to cook whole hog whole shoulders and ribs but Memphis and May being so big, you can imagine with on-site judges, um, they limit us to cooking one main meat category. So you have to choose which one you want to cook. What happens is um, at noon on Saturday, I will send a blind box in to be judged by four judges. And um, at the same time, my first judge will show up for 15 minutes. That judge will leave. I'll have another judge come in for 15 minutes. That judge will leave, and I'll have another judge come in. So I'm judged in preliminaries by seven different judges. They then take those preliminary scores, and the top three teams in hog, the top three teams in shoulders, and the top three teams in ribs advance to the final round, where four judges judge all nine teams to figure out who's the grand champion that day. Wow. So, I mean, it's, it's quite a substantial judging process. Oh, definitely, yeah. You know, and and really, I mean, it's it's just like any other uh, sanctioning body. Um, you have to win your blind table. If you, if you lose your blind table, you're out of finals. So um, that that's where you make it or break it in blind. Because of the amount of judging that goes on and, and all of these steps to get to that final, who's going to win between the ribs and the pork shoulder and the hog, are these like the, the most experienced of the uh, Memphis barbecue judges or h- how are they, uh, are they trained or how are they certified? How does that work out? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, they have to go through class. They have to judge contests. They have to be certified in order to judge at Memphis May. So, you know, the judging um, is great. You know, we don't have celebrity judges. We don't have, um, you know, people coming out the street or judges that have just been trained. I mean, they have to judge before they can judge Memphis May. So, you know, we have a great lineup of judges um, at that competition. 
Melissa Cookson joining us here on the show, talking about upcoming, uh, the upcoming Memphis and May competition this weekend. You know, another thing folks might not understand is, especially when compared to some of these other sanctioning bodies, this Memphis and May costs a substantial amount for a lot of the teams that are going to be competing. You know, just for instance, what is Yazoo's looking to go in expense wise for this weekend? Um, you know, I hadn't been keeping up with it this year, just like I hadn't been keeping up with much stuff. <laughs> um, I, I figure, um, you know, because of the stuff that I do, I'll probably spend around eight thousand dollars. Wow, eight thousand dollars. So, I mean, just for um, you know, comparison, you're looking at maybe what uh, on the high side, eleven, twelve hundred dollars for a KCBS event. So, we're looking at least seven, potentially eight times more than you know some of the other sanctioning bodies that are out there. Yeah, you know, it, it all depends. I mean, no, you don't have to spend that much money, of course. Um, but you know, I I certainly don't go um, like a lot of the teams will build three story scaffolding. You know, and it's um, they have huge corporate sponsors, so you know it's it's about the show and the party and the feeding of people. Um, my tent is much smaller. I don't feed a lot of people. I'm, I'm there. It, that's my business. You know, it's not um, what I do. Um, the party scene's not my thing. So you know, I'm I'm there to win. Um, so I don't do a lot of extracurricular activities that, I mean, some of these teams will spend upwards of a hundred thousand dollars down there. Oh my God. Do you think that, well, not do you think, but what percentage of teams that are setting up and, and doing this whole big entertainment and, and three story buildings and all this stuff compared to somebody like yourself, who's a little bit more scaled down, a little bit more focused on winning. What's the percentage between teams like yourself and the teams that are just looking to blow out? Um, you know, I, I really wouldn't have any idea. I, I'm going to be honest with you. When I go to Memphis in May, I don't do a lot of walking around. I pretty much get to my booth and I stay there um, just because, you know, it is business for me and I kind of have to get in my zone. Um, you know, I, I know there are a lot of, of teams that are corporate sponsored and party teams, but I would say that probably 75 80 percent are there to win. So you're going to be going for the overall grand champion repeat this coming weekend and obviously stretch that hog win out to four years in a row. You know, when you couple these together, do you and the team feel any extra added pressure to not only perform well here, but win no matter what? Well, you know, Memphis in May is one of the hardest contests to win, in my opinion. I mean, it, 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 it's so crazy. There's so many teams there. There's um, you know, both on site and blind judging. So there's many rounds of judging that you have to go through. So, you know, it's, 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 it's really hard to win down there. And, um, you know, we just have to, have to do what we do, um, hope for the best. Um, but, you know, there's so much luck involved. I mean, lightning very seldom strikes twice in the same place. You know, any time that I can, I can do well down there is, 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 just crazy to me. I mean, you know, that stuff just doesn't happen. I've had a very lucky streak down there. I have no expectations of this year, um, just because, you know, uh, it's kind of cyclical. Um, but, you know, we're just going to go do what we do and hope for the best. Melissa Cookson joining us here on the show, Yazoo's Delta Q Pitmaster. You know, Melissa, does it ever feel like because of the success that you have had down there, and as you said, it's very difficult to win, uh, and the fact that you have also been on TV, you've had success in other sanctioning bodies as well, some of these other big events, uh, for instance, the Kingsford Invitational, that if you don't come out on top or at least finish right near the top, people might presume that, oh, they're falling off, or perhaps even worse <laughs> than that, perhaps even worse than that, if you win, it's like you're expected. It's almost like a no-win situation to a certain degree. You know, I was having the same conversation earlier today. The expectations that are put on us are are really unfair. Um, you know, if 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 I don't do well, which I fully expect not to do well, then you know she's lost it. Or well, there has been. You know, um, you know, each and every time that you go out, it's you know it's a new experience. There's new judges. There's you know um, new teams that that have been competing a lot lately. Um, you know, and I think it's a really unfair expectation to think that those of us, you know, there are those of us who have moved on, you know, I've got a book coming out, I've got restaurants going, I've got a ton of TV stuff um, I've been doing, I have not been able to cook on the circuit. So, you know, 
is it fair to expect me to go win Memphis in May? I don't think so, you know. But there are those that, you know, those naysayers that will say, well, you know, um, if you did it, you ought to be able to do it again. <laughs> I don't know. I, You know, I just I try not to, to read anything into that and, and just go do the best I can. Will you have a pretty crowded tent? I mean, you have the reputation out there for, for doing well. You've won it two out of three years. Uh, you finished, you know, high in the overalls when you haven't won it outright. Will you have a lot of people stopping by the Yazoo's tent and trying to take pictures and shake hands and get a book signed or whatever? I have nine different media, national media filming crews that will be with me this weekend. Really? Nine? Nine. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, you're going to have uh, quite also, a bit of people. I'm also um, entertaining Iron Chef Michael Simon. Really? Oh, he's a uh, he's a <laughs> Cleveland guy. You uh, asked that son of a bitch why he shines me to come on this show. What is that? What is going on with that? I will ask him. I know. I know. I can count on you, Melissa, to ask him the tough question <laughs> on when we're five minutes apart when he's here. Why he won't come in and sit on my couch? I mean, that's certainly not weird, right? Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> I, I, you, you, I, I never hold punches. I tell it like it is. You know that. Everybody knows that. So right. hell, I'll ask him. I appreciate that. All right, so uh, I'm trying to gauge my time here because we do have a very huge announcement, which you're actually going to allow me to scoop here. So I'm uh, just kind of scanning some of my other uh, questions here before uh, we get into that. Um, Let's see. Well, I would ask you this question, but you don't think you're going to... I don't know. Here's the one thing that I find very intriguing about you is, you know, even without all the restaurant stuff and when you were doing very well, you know, prior to all these other ventures, uh, you always seem to be more humble than I would expect somebody who has experienced the success. You know, sometimes you have success once or you have a good year and then you fall off and that's it. You're never heard from again. But being able to keep it up year after year, I think that allows for, I don't want to call it uh, arrogance, but it allows for some type of confidence to say, yeah, you know, I feel pretty good about what we're going to be doing, or I would expect to go in and win this event. Uh, you, you've seemed to maintain quite a humble personality when asked about all this stuff. Is that just kind of a way you were brought up, or do you really feel that it's best to, to keep your head down and, and keep moving? If the good things come, then, you know, all the better. Yeah, you know, um, I don't think anyone should ever rest on their laurels. I don't, you know. Um, when I was growing up, my grandfather always told me, Melissa, if you're good at something, you won't ever have to tell anybody. They'll already know. Um, you know, I was raised by a very um, humble family. And, you know, I don't know how many times I've heard my grandmother say, don't get too big for your britches, because when you do, <laughs> somebody will bring you down. And, uh, you know, you never know what's around the corner or, or you know, what tomorrow will bring. Um, you know, I do come from, from very humble beginnings. And, you know, that that's who I am. That's who I'll always be. Um, and, and, you know, I'm I'm not really big on arrogance or, you know, I mean, it's just like barbecue. You know, who am I to say what good barbecue is? You know, if you were raised and your mom cooked ribs in a crock pot and put barbecue sauce on it and that's what you love then who am I to say that's not good barbecue you know so I, I just believe in putting your head down like you said doing what you do hoping for the best and working your butt off to learn something and be better every time sage advice from Melissa Cookston of Yazoo's Delta Q all right, Melissa, uh, we got like five minutes uh, or so left, so let me uh, turn the floor over to you. Let me give you the drum roll here uh, for a major announcement coming from Melissa Cookston. Melissa, the floor is yours. Well, um, Myron Nixon and I have buried the hatchet, and we are now friends. You buried the hatchet in his back? <laughs> no. All right. Also, everybody knows Barbecue Pitmasters has had um, guest judges this season. Yes. So I was lucky enough to um, be a guest judge twice for the show, and they have asked me to now be the third permanent judge with Tuffy and Myron. So really? I'll be up there with those guys. All right. Finally, somebody getting on there uh, that has uh, got a, a true palate that will be able to tell it like it is on these other guys. Um, when... W- when you were approached to do it, is that just like an automatic yes, um, or you know, what kind of a 
of a schedule does that going to require from you? I mean, it's not like you're not busy running two different restaurants in two different states and doing cookbooks and trying to also compete on the sanctioning body. Also, by the way, you're a wife and a mother and all this other stuff. How does this uh, schedule fit in for you? I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. I, at the time, had four different deals on the table, <clears throat> one being um, some very big networks. And um, Barbecue Pit Masters is kind of my comfort zone. I've been on the show twice as a competitor right. for in two seasons. Um, you know, I'm very comfortable with Myron and Tuffy, and I'm going to be honest with you, um, you need the support of the people who are doing the same thing you do because, you know, I'm not an actress by far, not an actress. Um, so, you know, it's tough to learn those lines and get up there and um, judge that barbecue and all of all the while you got cameras in your face and, you know, you're spazzing about, about what's going on at the restaurant, what's going on here, what's going on there. Oh, no, i got to get my publisher this. i got a photo shoot next week. You know, so it's really important to have the support of, of you know, those guys, too. And so it's a comfort thing for me, and, and my heart's always been with Barbecue Pit Masters. You know, they, they were the first people to put competition barbecue on TV, um, and this season is going to be fabulous because it goes back to barbecue roots. The audience is going to be able to learn things for people who are beginning, and it's it's going to be awesome. So, you know, if we can keep barbecue on TV, I will do whatever I can to make that happen. Absolutely uh, spectacular. So congratulations uh, to you on that bit of great news. And everybody, I'm getting a lot of instant chat here. Everybody's very excited that uh, we're going to see you on the uh, judges' table permanently, which is going to be outstanding. Uh, plus, now I can have you back and you know we can kind of uh, hash out different episodes when I uh, can find weird stuff to talk about with somebody who's actually there doing it. <laughs> so let me ask you this, um, and then I'll let you go. I know uh, you're very busy here getting ready for Memphis in May. Is, is, is it a lot to do about nothing with the Myron Mixon stuff, uh, was there really some bad blood there at one point, uh, or, or was it more of a vocal minority just kind of spouting off and not really know what they're talking about? You mean between me and Myron or, yes. or the, with the show? No, with you and Myron. Well, you got to realize, um, Myron and I had been competing against each other for a long time. He was the man to beat um, with Whole Hog. You know, when we came on the scene and we got really hot in Whole Hog, I mean... It's it's competitive nature to not like somebody that's kicking your butt. And, um, you know, I don't know. He doesn't like getting beat. I don't like getting beat. Um, so, you know, it, it was a, a huge competitive rivalry. Um, you know, now I've spent quite a bit of time with him and Tuffy. Um, you know, we're we're not in a competitive arena anymore against each other. We believe it or not, we have a lot of similarities. We have a lot of the same beliefs about barbecue. And at the end of the day, um, you know, that's really all that matters. Was there ever more of an issue with him having his ass kicked by you because you're a female? And if you would have been Tim Cookston, it wouldn't have mattered? I really don't think it would have mattered. <laughs> yeah. Just, you know, um, I, I gave it to him pretty good there for a few years. So, I, you know, I, I don't know. You know, nobody likes to get beat. Yeah, nobody likes to get beat. You were giving to him good enough where he decided to get out of whole hog and try and beat you with shoulder. That didn't work out too well, did it? <laughs> uh, Melissa Cookston joining Is us. It? Go ahead. No, nah, that's all right. Go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, Melissa Cookston is the pit master of Yazoo's Delta Q going for a second win overall in as many years this weekend at Memphis and May the Barbecue World Championship, and then the uh, fourth win in a row for whole hog category. So hopefully uh, all of this uh, great stuff is going to be taking place, and we can actually turn you around, and we can be recapping uh, all sorts of victory next Tuesday. How does that sound? You know, I hope so, but you really got to send that mojo my way because I need it extra, extra, extra this year. It is uh, on its way, an express package. You look for it, open it, and then enjoy all the great stuff that happens after that. I will bathe in it. <laughs> All right, Melissa, thanks very much. And, again, congratulations on the Pit Masters. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Greg. You got it. There she is. Melissa Cookston, Yazoo's Delta Q, going for that third win. Well, third and fourth year, but uh, second win repeat in a row for Memphis May. So we wish her good luck. And, um, man, really... One of the most uh, humble cooks out there uh, with the success that she has had. So 
you know, it's uh, kind of refreshing to see somebody that isn't uh, just out there to, you know, everybody's a little kind of a self-promoter. I'm not saying that she's not into self-promoting, but definitely humble. So uh, we wish her nothing but the best, and hopefully it turns out. Repeat winner would be spectacular. That would be three and four years, by the way. All right, uh, I want to talk to you quickly about JP Custom Smoke, big-time competitor, sometimes a custom pit maker, but he has some of the best rubs out there on the market right now, and here's what you have to choose from, especially this chicken rub, right? The last couple weeks was getting teams that were using it perfect scores in the land of KCBS. That's 180 points. JP's Sweet Heat Chicken Rub, JP's Custom Blend Pork Rub, and brand new to the market, the JP Custom Smoke Beef Rub, already helping teams win in the beef category like you couldn't believe. Maybe that's what you want to do. JPCustomSmoke.com is the website. You know, there's nothing better than seeing some of your scores tumble around and uh, things aren't going very well. And, you know, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Why not try and change up your rub spice a little bit? If you're using something that hasn't been working for you that well, don't be shy. Go ahead and start using some JP Custom Smoke right now. You're going to be happy that you did. Also, John is a big promoter of competitions that he is going to be taking part in. For instance, he is promoting the Valley Center Spring Fling Barbecue Contest. That's May 31st, so just in a short couple weeks. Uh, May 31st through June 1st, it is filled with 100% CBJs. Now, if you are interested, contact Marcella Peterson. Her phone number, 316-755-7340. That's 316-755-7340. Or you can hit up the website, V as in Victor, C, K, S as in Sam, vckschamber.com you know and on a personal note you know John and Tina Patty are some of the best folks on earth let alone on the competition circuit you know if you get a chance if you're going to be at uh, around this uh, spring fling barbecue contest May 31st through the 1st register take part and make sure that if you hook up down there that you make time to meet John and uh, Tina Patty really again some of the best people on earth plus he makes a mean bloody mean bloody All right, we'll change gears. We'll go horse racing next, folks. Uh, Stick around. We'll be right back. Get in the smoke. Call 877-448-0433 to get on the air. Now, here's your host, Greg Rampey. Big B, new shot band, suburban voice records. Let's go! I'm an outlaw, give me two shots. We don't need a radio, bring a jukebox. For my outlaws, bring me three shots. We can raise hell before the speed stops. I'm All right, we are back. 877-448-0433. Greg at the BBQ Central Show.com. Those are the uh, two ways to get in touch with me. Should you find it fit? Uh, my next guest, the official horse racing expert of the Barbecue Central Show. Two weeks ago, he came on to break down the lead-up to the Kentucky Derby, and he joins us now to do the same for the second leg of this year's Triple Crown. The Preakness will be coming off this Saturday at Pimlico, Pimlico Racetrack in the beautiful Baltimore, Maryland. Let's race over to the hotline. And welcome back, friend of the show, Harry DeHorse. Harry, how are you, buddy? Hey, Greg, how you doing tonight? Oh, Harry, I am absolutely spectacular. Where are we finding you right now? Typically, you are a world traveler hitting up uh, various locations across the country. Where are you at leading up to the uh, run in Baltimore? Well, you know, we're, we're right here in Baltimore. We uh, trying to uh, you know stay close to the action, Greg. Yeah, you know, uh, it, there's, not, there's nothing better than being here at uh, old Hilltop, as it's referred to. Uh, and uh, you know the crowds are you know getting uh, excited about the preliminary. It's a, it's a festival. You know every one of these uh, triple crown races is a, the, the run up to the bases is a, is a real event. All right, uh, Harry, as I just mentioned in the intro, the Preakness will be running this Saturday. And and before we break it down, 
For the peripheral fan, can you remind us of the three distances that these horses will be running in order to have a shot at this Triple Crown and, and how far apart they're spaced in between? Well, you know, Greg, they go from the starting line all the way to the finish line. <laughs> Look at this, you son of a bitch with your... All right. That is correct. Ain't nobody got time for that. A little, a little racetrack humor there. Very little. Uh, the Kentucky Derby, as you know, is a mile and a quarter. Uh, then we kind of bring the bring the horses back after two weeks off, and and the uh, the Preakness is <clears throat> a mile and three sixteenths. Some people call it a mile and eight. And then uh, as we look forward to the big race, uh, the Belmont Stakes, that's a mile and a half. That's a real workout for the kids. But you know, <clears throat> when you think about the uh, mile and an eighth uh, Preakness. It, it's as much of an effort for these uh, for these for these kids because even though the race is shorter, the time between the races is very short. Harry DeHorse joining us here on the show, the official horse racing expert of the Barbecue Central Radio Show. Uh, Harry, two weeks ago on a very muddy track, Orb was the class of the field, waiting until the round of the far turn to really steamroll past the rest of the field. And maybe you saw the same thing that I did, Harry, and post-race stats proved it out. Orb was not only running down the middle of the track, but he was actually trailing out a little bit towards the grandstand as well. You know, in the past, this has worked against a horse's bid for victory because, you know, in reality, he's running a longer race than some of those other horses because he is trailing out. In the final analysis, though, Orb was the best horse that day, or perhaps was there a better horse that didn't win? Well, you know, when you when you look at the way Orb ran that race, and Joel Rosario did a masterful job. And he kept the horse in the back for uh, for a considerable portion of of the race. But you know, Greg, when you when you're on a sloppy track, these jockeys have been riding races the entire day, and they know where the footing is the best. I think. As I look at as I look at the race over and over again, well, Joel ran a, a fantastic race. I, I really believe that the horse that ran second uh, probably ran the best race. But what what Joel did was he he used his experience from the previous races to find the footing in that part of the track that was able enabled Orb to dig down deep and uh, and really score from about deep mid to deep stretch to the shadow of the wire. There's no question. I, I, I think all of us who, who saw the race and, uh, by the way, may not have had that horse in, the, <clears throat> in their ticket, really <laughs> believe that Orb did a wonderful job and should have won a race. It was a good race. Harry DeHorse joining us here on the show. So as we turn to this coming weekend, Harry, the obvious choice for most, especially the uh, peripheral fan, is to say that Orb will be the favorite again. If it rains... Has he proven enough that he can run in the mud? And on top of that, um, this is the shortest of the three legs, which we just covered here a couple of questions ago. Uh, they sure. will all be running a mile and three sixteenths or a mile and an eighth, depending if you like to reduce fractions or not. Uh, with the way he ran two weeks ago, Orb should really have this preakness in his back pocket, barring any injury? There's no question about it. And by the way, Greg, <clears throat> we, we, look, we look days and days ahead for the weather. Uh, and we're all enjoying <clears throat> some pretty good weather here on the East Coast. Uh, uh, the weather here in Baltimore is beautiful, and the forecast for the weekend is supposed to be 77 degrees with uh, you know broken clouds and, and dry. So I think we'll have a very fast track. Now we'll we'll be able to see uh, we'll be able to see Orb perform in this element. And 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 I would just like to point out that you know the the finish. Uh, of the Derby was Orb, Golden Soul, and Revolutionary. Revolutionary and uh, and Golden Soul will not be running in the Preakness. By the way, neither will we. Neither will Verrazano. There are a couple of uh, reasons that I would like to discuss with your listeners about that at another time, because this is part of the reason that I think that the Triple Crown is being threatened year after year because they're having these horses being held back, coming in later to try to grab the Triple Crown at the Belmont. Uh, so, but but there's no question. Orb, Orb will absolutely, positively win this race. All right. So you kind of just alluded to my next question here, and I do think it's important to address this right now, Harry. You've seen this for years and years, but I don't know if the fringe fan knows that this actually goes on. You know, the horses that ran 
the Derby two weeks ago aren't necessarily running again this weekend. In fact, horses that are bred to run this specific distance they'll be running this weekend shipped in to try and win this leg of the Triple Crown. In effect, ruining Orb's bid for a Triple Crown stardom. Why is this allowed? Why not only have the horses that ran two weeks ago be eligible to run in the second and the third leg? I, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I mean, if you if you have, you know, there's a qualifying element that gets you into the derby. Once the derby is over, uh, <clears throat> you can you can enter anybody you want, any horse you want for the Preakness and uh, beyond that to the Belmont. Uh, it, 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 I, 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 I would have to tell you it's it's really an ownership issue whether or not you want to put up the stakes for you to enter into the the second leg of the triple crown or the third leg of the triple crown in 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 the old days you you entered for for the triple crown you entered for the derby the breakness and the belmont but as time went on and the stakes got higher and the entire event became more modern if you will now you have an international element who ship in horses from all over the world uh, once it's almost like once the derby is over, it's like, well, let's just go in and get what we can get. Now, for the purists like myself, like yourself, and many, many, many others, we're all rooting for a triple crown winner. We're all orb fans now. Uh, but you know, you look at the starting lineup for the for the Preakness, and don't forget, this is a this is a race that has a limit for a fourteen horse field. Yeah. You've got you've got orbs and you've got golden sense. You've got my Luke and it's my lucky day. We'll take charge. Those are the horses that came over from the Derby. Then you've got uh, uh, some horse named uh, Tickle Town Five and uh, you know Char- Governor Charlie and uh, you know Bob the Dog and Harry the Ho- you know they, they, it's just going to be to to my way of thinking this is going to be a five horse race. So it, it just seems that with the three differing distances and the amount of or lack of amount of time between the three races, chances for injury during every training run, the deck just seems so stacked against him already that the odds for another Triple Crown winner seem virtually impossible. So at least, and maybe it would generate even more fanfare that if you, you were able to somehow capture the horses that ran on the first leg and, and only say, okay, well, all these horses have to move uh, along the line accordingly and nobody else, no outsiders in, uh, that that would maybe draw a little bit more uh, fanfare from people that, you know, are they maybe they want to get a little bit more interested in horse racing, maybe they don't, because look, they see this one horse, and if he doesn't win the second one, nobody's going to watch, uh, well, I don't want to say nobody's going to watch the, the uh the Belmont stakes, but obviously the, the build up to that is going to be way dwindled if uh, compared to if Orb wins this coming weekend, and now we have a you know the two thirds uh, shot at winning and, and, and finishing it out again. It just seems so. If horse racing people are wondering why isn't it as popular as it could be, this has to be one of the reasons. <clears throat> it, there's no question that if if we. If, if we have a winter in the Derby and the Derby horse winters winners in the Preakness, then we have some good, you know, we've got, we've got some good personality there in, in the racehorse uh, game. And, and I refer back to horses like, uh, you know, your big Brown and even as recently as last year with I'll have another people rally around the winner. Uh, this is a very big reason why so many people are rooting for the Miami Heat at the moment. People rally around the winner, and uh, so they look they look forward to uh, having Orb now. And I said we're all Orb fans now. People look forward to having Orb win the Preakness. And and and, and if I'm invited to be on your show before the Belmont, should Orb win? The, the tempo of the, the run-up to that, that race will be enormous. Uh, if you look at the specimen himself, this is a magnificent animal. He's big. He's very strong. Big hawks. Uh, this, this horse has got the ability and the agility to be a triple crown winner. Now, I, I understand. Richie, please, would you stop being so different? Try to be unique. I'm talking. It, it, this horse has got the ability to do things that other horses have not been able to do recently. 
his workouts have been fantastic. And I have to say, from an emotional standpoint, we all like to see Suge McGahee win the Triple Crown, wouldn't we, Greg? Of course. All right, so let's get to the most important part here. Uh, Centralites who are looking to get down on this race want to spend a minimum, get a maximum in return, but who doesn't? Uh, what are you recommending as far as wagers are concerned for this weekend? <clears throat> well, you know my position on the winner. Or, I've, got a, I've got a triple uh, or an exacta box, depending on how you'd like to play the, let's play do, the exacta. Let's do both. I would say orb over in my exact. I would say orb over the top of my loop. Very fond of that uh, Rosie Napravnik and Oxbow. Now Oxbow, here we go again with the uh, emotional uh, Gary Stevens, right. D Wayne Lucas. Uh, that, that's your value horse. On the other hand, you could also play that as a triple. That would be orb, my loop, and Oxbow going to stay away from anything uh, other than that in, in this particular race. You know, at the, 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 the watchmaker odds at this point in time on, on Orb is one-to-one. One. Uh, it, you know, it's like the old saying goes from the movie. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie. But the only way this horse can lose is if lightning strikes him in the starting gate. <laughs> I might have heard that line somewhere before. Why do you like the odds on lightning? Uh Absolutely. No, I don't. Uh, all right, so there we go. Those are your uh, wagers. Uh, orb to win, hands down. And then uh, yep. Orb uh, or my loot for the for the exacta. Uh, you can also throw an oxbow on those two uh, to make your triple and uh, bet them how you like. Would, I mean, w- would you do like an orb over the top of everybody, or, or is that like a worthless bet? I, <clears throat> if I it, well, if they ran the race this minute. Uh, with the odds being orb one to one, and the nearest uh, the nearest favorite after him being uh, Golden Sense at six to one, sure I'd I'd wheel I'd wheel orb uh, and hope one of those twelves or twenties come in. It, it's not going to be a it's only going to be a twenty four dollar bet for two dollars. Yeah, I would I would do that, but they're not going to run the race t- tonight, and 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 those odds are all going to change, of course, Greg. And that's a good question, by the way. For your uh, for your listeners who have time, uh, don't forget. Uh, much like we had uh, the Kentucky Oaks before the Derby, uh, <clears throat> the the day before we had the Black Eyed Susan in Baltimore, and uh, I I would tell your friends and listeners to keep a close eye on a <clears throat> on a young filly named Emollient. Emollient. Uh, I wouldn't say bet the paycheck, but I would certainly give up a few cocktails and put maybe 20 on that one. All right. Uh, we'll look for that as well. Harry DeHorse, the official thoroughbred racing expert of the Barbecue Central Show. Harry, uh, here's to hoping we are back in two weeks' time trying to figure out uh, how Orb is going to win at the Bullring, which is a whole different discussion in itself, and finish this triple, uh, triple Crown uh, off. Uh, and as we all know, the last winner of the Triple Crown was... Affirmed. Affirmed. Absolute. Come on. Who are we asking? Uh, Harry's always appreciate the time. Thanks for coming on tonight. Thank you, thank you, Greg. Please say hello to your beautiful family for me. I sure will, as always. There he is, Harry the Horse. All right, so if you were looking to have some uh, wagering going on, uh, Orb to win, that's one bet. Uh, a Exacta, which is two horses. Uh, Orb and my loot. And if you want to do a triple, we call that the uh, exact uh, triple orb oxbow my loot Uh, be sure to bet it in a box come on let's not get into that triple box exact a box all right you know what i love to do guys Uh, regardless of the uh, time of year i love to cook on my grills and smokers Uh, if you have charcoal fired outdoor cooking appliances i encourage you to give kebroke hardwood lump charcoal to try for your next cooking session quite simple it is one of the best kept secrets around used by award-winning barbecue competition teams and backyard warriors just like this guy that's right kebroke hardwood charcoal is made from natural hardwood trees without any additives they only use high quality wood for their charcoal not scrap wood or any other wood waste or additives this is the real charcoal that humans have made for thousands of years 
since we've left the caves and moved on to our patios and decks, become highfalutinous, if you will. All natural hardwood charcoal performs significantly better than regular charcoal. It burns longer, it's hotter, produces lower amounts of ash, but the taste it will impart on your food is second to none. Here's what I encourage you to do. Visit kebroke.com. That's K-E-B-R-O-A-K. Kebroke to find out more about this product. Uh, they ship to all continental U.S. states through Amazon.com. Check this out. Amazon offers free shipping on all their bags, but the most attractive option is their 40-pound bag, which you can get for you know roughly around a dollar a pound. I did check it out today. It's a little bit. It's nudging a little north of 45. Uh, but depending on what day you check Amazon, you know I've seen it as low as 39.99 with free shipping as well. Uh, this is stuff that you can't find locally, delivered directly to your door by Amazon.com. No more hassles of dragging the bags through the supermarket, getting your car full of dust or anything like that. Uh, I cooked four pork tenderloins on it in my pit barrel cooker. I went against uh, logic and all of that other stuff. And I said, hey, that pit barrel cooker, I didn't like the way the Kingsford tasted in there. I'm going to go Kebroke hardwood lump charcoal. Fired it up with my Luft lighter. It was fantastic. I have a whole review on that that I'll probably have to be doing next week. But I use it, and it is dense, and it lasts a long time, and it burns consistently. You know, especially when we're talking about lump charcoal, not typically a word you can use when you're talking about lump is consistent. Uh, this is a secret of Southern Miami for years. Now it's ready for the world to enjoy. Again, the website, Kebroke, K-E-B-R-O-A-K, KebrokeCharcoal.com. Get yours right now. We'll be back to wrap up the first hour right after this. Stick around. We'll be right back. Live from the Barbecue Central Radio Network Studios in Cleveland, Ohio. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Radio Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rempe. All right, we're back. I just want to point out, John Pope is talking about uh, betting stuff. And I just want to make sure that we all... uh, understand here. Hold on one second. Uh, Neat. All right. Uh, John Pope talking about exactas and trifectas, so uh, doubles or triples, depending on what you know. Um, What he is saying is 50% correct. If you do an exacta box or a trifecta box, uh, all you have to do is pick the horse number that you want. As long as those three horses come in, uh, it doesn't matter if they come in first, second, or third. As long as you have those horses bet, as long as they all show up in the first, second, or third place, regardless of who's first or not, uh, you win. But only if you bet the box portion. So you go up to the... You go up and say, hey, I want, uh, I'm want. i going to place a bet, uh, 4 one, three, trifecta box, or exact the box. Bet the box. It's a couple extra bucks, but it gives you so much more leeway. Because if you bet one four five and they don't come in one four five, you're screwed. If you bet one four five, but you box it, 5 could come in first, or 4 could come in first, or 1 could come You get the end. Always do the box. I'm just trying to help your folks. I'm trying to save you money, make me money. If you win on these, uh, of course, uh, 50% uh, comes back to me because I have the horse racing extra. It's John, it's better to be 50% right some of the time, right? Just say box, exact the box, okay? Trifecta box or double trip, whatever you like. All right, uh, we're going to wrap up here. Uh, thanks to Harry the Horse. Thanks to... Melissa Cookston, Yazoo's Delta Q, wishing them good luck, her, Pete, and the rest of the team. Looking for that uh, repeat win two years in a row. That would be uh, three out of the last four. And uh, thanks again to Harry DeHorse for getting up a little bit of a lead up to the Triple Crown, the second leg, the Preakness, running in Pimlico. Very excited for that. I'll be in Aurora for a uh, softball tournament. Again. All right, give me two minutes. I'm going to get some more water, and then we're looking forward to the second hour, which will see us interviews with Andy Husbands and Bruce Pryor from Barbecue Dragon. Stick around. We will be right back. Understand my 
my intention. Happy to have you. Hey, this is Helen Paris from SoCal, and you are listening to the Barbecue Central Show. From my heart and from my hand, why don't people understand my intention? Happy to have you aboard here for the really big barbecue show. We cook because we have to, and we grill because we want to. Fine, how's it going? <laughs> you have a great show, I'm a big fan. So what 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 seems to be the problem here? This man looks like he's dead and he's in the in the crackle. Charbono! It's all about the Charbono, dude! Succulent fish, what? We ate fifty four wieners. Delicious, Lavernius. Shake face. I'm shaking like a dog. Shit, peach seeds. <laughs> we have top men working on it right now. Ooh. Top men. All right. Welcome to the second hour, ladies and gentlemen. Hey. Oh, top men. Who's going to bet this weekend? Anybody betting? Still to come tonight, as I had uh, previously mentioned, Andy Husband, chef owner of Tremont 647 and co-author of Wicked Good Burgers. Also rounding out the show, Bruce Pryor will be talking about the product, the Barbecue Dragon. Looking forward to that. Uh, On the show next week, I hope to land the winner of the Memphis and May competition. Derek Riches from uh, bbq.about.com rejoins me and uh, sponsor of the show, owner of Kebro Charcoal, Sebastian Busser joins us. Looking forward to talking a little charcoal with him. All right, the uh, Sam's Club Series rolled into Knoxville, Tennessee this past weekend. This was a local qualifier that feeds into the Hendersonville, Tennessee regional final, which will take place on September 14th this coming Top six teams moving on to the regional round are taking grand champion with a 677.7140 Rocky Top Barbecue. Reserve grand champion, uh, 677.1426, so uh, just uh, six tenths of a point or so off. Uncultured Swahe. Uh, Third place won the Jack Daniels World Championship, I think, five years ago or so. Uh, Chad Hayden Moonswiners makes it in. Uh, Rounding out the uh, rest of the top six. Number four, Ash Kickers Barbecue. Number five, Joe B's Blazing Butts. Joe B's? Joe B's? Never mind. And number six, uh, By the Skin of His Teeth. Warren County Pork Chops, Donnie Burke. Congratulations to Donnie. Poked a little fun at him this past weekend after I saw the results. He's like, man, I just made it in. I was like, hey, as long as you make it in, sixth place, first place, what's the difference? I mean, you know, cash money is a difference, but, you know, aside from the cash, you know, who, who's worried about the cash, man? Forget it. We're all good with that. All right. Give me a little bit of room here. I got a couple minutes. You know, this isn't barbecue-related. But you might recall from last week's show, if you uh, actively listen, I had mentioned that my oldest daughter, Bobby, was uh, turning 12. Well, Friday night we hosted a sleepover here for uh, five of her school friends, uh, which in the end you know, wasn't anywhere near as bad as I guess I had initially anticipated in my head. And really at that age, it could be low-key or it could be loud estrogen pumped outing that rages on until all hours of the night and into the early morning and i think we probably landed somewhere you know maybe even a little bit less than the middle uh, after the final analysis but here's the question when did parents stop walking kids to the door i think uh, one parent out of the five that dropped off their kids, bothered to come to the door. Is anybody interested in uh, what's going on in the house or the, the parents' home? Hey, here's my kid. Yeah, just go in the parents' home. Uh, is it safe there? Keep in mind, holding uh, just one of these kids, I don't, me and my wife, we don't really know the other parents, you know, especially not enough to just do a drop and run. I mean, you got to be kidding me. 
Again, this isn't 16 and 17 year olds that we're talking about. These are 12 year old girls. You know, I always maybe I'm out of the minority, or maybe I'm out of the, maybe I'm in the minority. That's what I wanted to say. Um, I st- right now, you know, if Bobby's going over to somebody's house to spend the night, I always go into the house, no matter what, no matter how long I've known you, because uh, one, it's polite. Two, I can ask or answer any questions the parents might have about pickup times or food allergies or whatever. Three, I can visually assess the situation. How many people are there? How many parents are there? How many will there be overnight? And most importantly, this is the thing that freaks me out the most, right? I want to know who's going to be there, right? If the kid has other siblings... Are any of their friends over as well? I mean, I don't know the sibling that well, and I sure as hell don't know the friends of that sibling at all. And I want to know exactly who I'm going to start torturing to get the information in case something goes south. And I do want to do it in the most efficient and effective way possible. And exacting, by the way. So going into the house helps me gain a full recon perspective of the situation. So if something does happen, I know I can barge right in with all of my guns, realize that, uh, you know, Timmy's friend Nick is a puss, and then I can strap him down into a chair and start pulling out his fingernails to get the best information the quickest. He's the one that's going to give it up the quickest when I start pulling out his fingernails for torture. By the way, number four, maybe this should be number one. Uh, it's the right thing to do. <laughs> I mean, I can always, uh, already see the emails and the Facebook posts. Rempy, you are way too paranoid. Have another drink. Maybe. Maybe I am. I would rather be a little overprepared for something that might not happen than be ill-prepared for something that is currently happening that I now have no control over because I just did a drop and run. I mean, that's my kid. I want to feel as comfortable as possible that who I am leaving her with, or the other two for that matter, I want to know that who I'm leaving her with and where I am leaving them is safe, or at least as safe as I can make it. These parents think that you can just give a kid a cell phone, drop them off, and everything is fine. And if something goes wrong, they can just make a call for help. You know, I think with everything that has gone on, especially here in Cleveland, the last uh, week or so, parents would think like that. Man, I saw it on Friday. Ain't nobody got time for that. Weird. Weird. Trust me, the cell phone isn't helping you. Ten years ago, cell phones were still pretty popular. Okay? Maybe not everybody had them at that point. But things happen where cell phones aren't going to save you. Okay? So don't just assume. And if you're a parent wondering, and I don't know parents, you're probably that parent. Don't assume because you give a kid a phone that they are now completely safe. Nothing could be further from the truth. Kids lose phones all the time. Uh, From what I have learned from kids that have phones, kids do not charge phones, ever. They are always dying. They are always looking to get some type of charge on their phone wherever they can plug something in. So, again, if I'm in the minority here... That's fine, but I'm always going to be a little bit more overprotective, and it has nothing to do with me just having daughters, I would hope. Um, I just want to make sure we're all safe here, okay? I just want to make sure we're all safe. That's fine. All right. Uh, Let me quickly tell you also that uh, last week, you would recall, I had the pit master of True Bud Barbecue on, Tim Grant. We talked at length about uh, the win streak that he was on and all this other stuff. Uh, They competed in the Sertoma 48 barbecue contest, missed winning their fourth straight event by like one and three tenths point, but they did take reserve grand championship and in the process took over number one ranking for KCBS team of the year points race. So congratulations to Tim, the rest of the True Bud barbecue team. You know, I know Tim was pissed that he missed winning four in a row by such a small margin. And from all accounts, he would have been the first, he's probably going to hate me for saying this, but from all accounts, according to KCBS, Tim would have been the first team to ever pull off a four-peat win. Four in a row. Four contests in a row. Uh, but hey, he can start all over again this weekend and uh, make another run at four in a row. Sweet Brown, what do you got to say about that? Ain't nobody got time for that. I know. Well, Tim's got time for it now. 
Also, I did mention that I uh, cooked on that pit barrel cooker this past weekend. Uh, four pork tenderloins, my fave, uh, but did it using the anti pit barrel cooker way. I used Kebroke lump charcoal instead of the Kingsford blue bag. I used a loofed lighter instead of lighter fluid and used the included grill grate instead of hanging them with the hooks, which is a unique feature about the pit barrel cooker. So, you know, no hanger bars in the bottom. The vent hole on the bottom was wide open. Let that Kebroke fire up for about 10 minutes with the top off and then got to cooking. I stuck a therm in one of those uh, hole bars or the bar holes and uh, was cooking right around a good solid 350, 365 all the way through the cook. And, you know, there isn't an overwhelming preference of the uh, charcoal smoke that the Kingsford makes when fat drops on it. I get a different flavor with the hardwood lump charcoal. And uh, those changes really help the overall product. And I can't wait to actually try chicken on this thing. Um, probably won't be this weekend because we got softball, but maybe at some point during the week uh, next week. Uh, also, I used the Denny Mike's pork seasoning, and it was great. Uh, the amount that you get was a little small, a little disappointed in the amount of rub that you get from Denny Mike's, but we also used all of his sauces. Uh, between the eight adults, the majority favorite was the Carolina sauce, followed by the Sweet Heat sauce, and then uh, Hot and Nasty was third. The uh, There was like a, a mosquito, m- massive mesquite or something like that. Meathead, I mean uh, pork tenderloins. <laughs> Wait a second. Or whatever they're calling the new pork. They used to call it pork tenderloin. <laughs> you know, the smaller ones. Not the big square box loins. Tenderloins. No, I'm not confused. Am I confusing it? I apologize if I'm confusing it. I think I know what I'm talking about. It says pork tenderloin on the thing. All right, folks, let me talk to you really quick about a couple different ways to step up your barbecue and grilling game. No easier way than by adding a little Butcher's Barbecue to your arsenal. Now, do you need some validation before you head on over to ButcherBarbecue.com? No problem. How about this? The last three winners of the Houston Livestock Barbecue Contest have all used and won with Butcher's Barbecue. Teams in the KCBS, top teams in the KCBS, the FBA, the IBCA, all use Butcher Barbecue products. How about the fact that the pitmaster of Butcher Barbecue uses Butcher Barbecue products? All that did was get him third place in KCBS Team of the Year in 2011. Do I have to say more? Do I have to say I do not. Look, we all know they're well-known for the injections, the pork, the beef, now the prime injection, which has combined all the things loved from their beef injection, using its award-winning flavor enhancer and its ability to keep your brisket juicy. They have combined it with what has become the competition standard in beef flavor, available for sale right now at ButcherBBQ.com. Of course, you know widely and rangily about the sauces and rubs that they have, the steak and brisket rub, the honey rub. The premium rub, which if you inject with Butcher's Barbecue, is formulated to work with that injection hand-in-hand. It's almost like this perfect one-two punch to impress judges and friends alike. So you want to make sure you get some of that. And then don't forget, if you you have been wronged by another commercial injection maker, you've been screwed in the past before if you didn't like it. Not anymore. You can go right to ButcherBBQ.com, hit the trade-in link. And then whatever amount you have left that's commercially packaged, you send off to Dave. He'll weigh it. That weigh is final. And then in return, he'll give you back the pork product. He'll give you back the beef product or the premium injection, whatever you like. Nobody else is doing that. He's making his customers happy. He's trying to make his competitors' customers happy as well. How about that? No worries on breaking the bank on shipping. Eight fifty. Four items at $55. Anything from $55 to $200 ship at $9.75. Anything over $200 ships exactly for free. ButcherBBQ.com. That's ButcherBBQ.com. I'm actually going to be uh, grabbing some beef injection myself here shortly, so uh, stick around. We will be right back. Broadcasting live from the Barbecue Central Radio Network Studios in Cleveland, Ohio. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Radio Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rampey. All right, welcome back. 877-448-0433. Greg at the BBQ Central Show.com. Oh, i got to get my... I get my thing here uh, all lined up here for the next. All right, my first guest in the second hour, 
chef owner of Tremont 647 and Sister Sorrel, both located in Boston, Massachusetts. Also the co-author of one of the most, uh, am I going to say one of the most biggest? I think my English teacher would slap the shit out of me. Uh, one of the biggest barbecue books to come out over the past few years, Wicked Good Barbecue, which he wrote with uh, IQ pitmaster Chris Hart. One of, On the heels of that effort, they went back to the writing room and produced the newest effort, aptly named Wicked Good Burgers, which we'll be discussing tonight. So let's go ahead and race back over to the hotline. And welcome back, friend of the show, Andy Husbands. Andy, how are you, buddy? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing absolutely fabulous, Andy. Appreciate you asking. A uh, bunch of different things we can talk about here tonight, but last time we spoke, we were discussing how well your book, Wicked Good Barbecue, was doing and how it was exceeding expectations and all of this great stuff, and then to follow up with it. Uh, no longer do we have to wait. I believe it was like uh, April that it was released. Wicked Good Burgers hit the bookstore. How did you and Chris decide to go after the burgers versus some other kind of fare that you might hit on? You know, well, Chris and I kind of um, always have a competitive nature with each other and uh, kind of inspire each other to do better. And we got into a huge discussion about the better burger, kind of the better burger movement that's happening now and how to make the best burger. And from there, it it just jumped to let's write a book about it. Better burger movement. So what what does that mean to you specifically? (laughs) And, so the Better Burger movement, and you guys, I'm sure, have it out there as well. We certainly have it in Boston and New York. You know, all these wonderful, great places. You know, we have Tasty Burger, Shake Shack, just places that are putting out these really great, high-quality burgers in a volume setting. That is what the Better Burger movement is. So it's moving away from your Burger Kings, your Wendy's, your oh, McDonald's. Absolutely. Uh, Andy Husband's joining us here on the show. Uh, co-author Wicked Good Barbecue. Uh, some websites for Andy. Tremont, T-R-E, is it Tremont or Tremont? I'm sorry. Either one works well. All right. Tremont uh, or Tremont. T-R-E-M-O-N-T and then the numeral 647.com. Uh, also, fearlesschef.com if you want to check them out while we're talking. Uh, Andy, you're a fine dining chef by profession. Uh, one could look at you and burgers being, I guess, uh, perhaps a bit divergent just through stereotypical thoughts. Have you always been a burger lover? Yeah, I mean, burgers to me, you know, are, are more than than just a, a fuel for your body. To me, that smell that we sm- you know, smell in the summertime of grills lighting up and that wonderful charred smell we smell of meat is, is, is one of my favorite things, you know, from early childhood. Who doesn't love a burger? It's an American institution. So if I stroked you a, a blank check right now or gave you a you know, $100 bill and said, go get <laughs> your favorite burger, where is it located and what would it be? <laughs> well, it would have to be located here, of course. Uh, Tremont 647. Um, you know, I mean, for me, uh, the best burger is just really, you know, good quality products on a great bun over some really high heat. That's probably your most important thing is cooking it over good high heat. Well seasoned, of course. Andy has been joining us here on the show. You know, there have been a few burger books that have come out over the past few years. Uh, one that jumps right to my mind, uh, most notably, would be the Ted Reader's Everyday Gourmet Burger Book. How does Wicked Good Burgers differ from some of these other more recent burger efforts by other authors? Well, I mean, of course, in one way it's the same. We're talking about uh, some kind of vessel that's going to have some kind of meat product in between. But what Chris and I do is, um, and we did it in Wicked Good Barbecues, we really kind of bring it down to the bare bones. We bring it to you, really explain to you how to make the best quality burger or barbecue in Wicked Good Barbecue. Really want to teach people how to just make it the best. We explain it very simply, and we think it out very thoroughly to come up with the best kind of recipes and solutions. So if you're asking what the difference is, of course, I'm going to tell you ours is better, but I really think that we focus on technique, 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 which is very important. So what kind of a uh, writing process is it for you and Chris? I mean, you guys have known each other, you know, growing up in grade school and all that stuff. Uh, you, you say you're both very competitive. You like to have these engaging conversations, if we can say that nicely. Uh, are you guys, like, in the same office? Are you sending uh, emails and documents back and forth? Is a little bit of both. How do you put this book together? It's a little bit of both. I mean, Chris, uh, luckily, him and I um, have a great relationship, so we try to, uh, you know, see each other whenever possible. Um, you know, it starts off by kind of hanging out and just talking about what if, and I uh, wonder if we can, and what do you think about this? 
and then kind of writing on a list and list of recipes, editing, editing, editing. And then we kind of, um, him and I have similar and then also different strengths. So we'll kind of focus on what's going to work the best and what's, who's going to be able to, you know, like this would be better if you wrote this, this is better if I wrote that. And then we just kind of separately go at it, yet together look at it, meaning that we kind of look at each other's recipes, we critique each other's recipes, and, you know, support each other where we're necessary. Were you guys on a strict deadline, or is this a kind of an at-your-pace book with some suggested times of turning? I have never heard of a at your pace kind of book in my life. It's always a strict deadline. It's always we want it yesterday. Um, yeah, you know, they. I mean, our, we love our editors. We love our um, publishers. And but you know, they have a timeline, and you know, they. If you want to get into about how books are done, you know, they're investing, they're investing time and energy and their resources in us to come up with a good. Um, you know, product, and they want to be able to get a return on their investment. So, you know, a quicker return is always better. So, you know, they they do want them quickly, but they also you know give us the time to to write them. You know, you 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 need a certain amount of time because all of our recipes are written, but then they got to be edited. Then they've got to go get tested, and sometimes they need to get retested three times just to make sure they're perfect. So it does take time to write you know hundred recipes for a book. But, uh, you know, probably about six months is what it takes to turn around a book. Well, I was going to say, you know, do you and Chris set up, like, test kitchens and really try each and every recipe in this book before it actually gets to print? Obviously, it sounds like it does. But, you know, before you're submitting recipes and it's and the book people are testing it, do you guys already have a bunch of this stuff that you have maybe put together in times past when you're, you know, maybe at a barbecue competition, you're eating some burgers, you know, on a Friday night? Uh, or where are all these recipes coming from? A little bit of everything, you know, from growing up with around food. Him and both him and I have food families we've kind of grown up in. From you know being curious about food to dining out, um, you know, they kind of come from everywhere. Um, based on other ways we've seen other things and other flavors, but you know, I, I would definitely say though, in the testing process, one one thing that's really important is, and yes, we've, we him and I have tested every single one, but. Um, What's also important is that we actually have somebody else test it, meaning that somebody else who's not familiar with the recipe, because that's who the recipes are written for, for people at home, for you. And we need to make sure that people understand them and can read them, not that, you know, because I understand what Chris is saying, but will you understand that? And that's what's most important to us, it's that, that the consumer is, is able to cook, cook with it. Andy Husband's joining us here on the show talking about the book Wicked Good Burgers, Tremont647.com. One website, FearlessChef.com is other website. Were there some burger recipes that you guys had in, in concept, but when you put in the test kitchen, failed miserably and, and didn't end up making the cut? Oh, yeah. In fact, we just had a meeting because we're, we're actually writing another book, believe it or not. And, um, you know, we said, you know, okay, we needed, I think we needed 100 recipes. We had 100 titles, and I'm like, we were both kind of like, well, we need more because there's always, it's like, I think probably in any creative process, a lot of, uh, you know, editing ends up on the floor, you know, like that's not going to work. This was a great idea, but it just didn't work. And um, we're kind of always prepared for that. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, not a lot, but there are some recipes that just, in, in, you know, they sound so good, but in theory don't work out as well as you'd like them to. And, and there's no reason to, you know, there's no reason to put a product out that you that you don't love. All right, so you I've, can come up with something you do. Uh, I've asked a lot of uh, great softball questions, uh, leading you down the primrose path of security. But let's go ahead and break down the basics <laughs> now, Andy. Uh, what do you need, and, and how do you make a good burger? What are those essential uh, tools or ingredients? Okay, that's that's a great question, and. Um, so what's great about this book is we came to try to make the best burger ever, and we could not agree, which is the best part about it. Right. So we will agree that we need high, high, high heat. We mm-hmm. like 600, 700 degree heat. So we want to get that really great sear. Chris is going to tell you a plancha. He wants you to do it on like a plancha, which is like a kind of a griddle or a skillet. That's what he loves. He loves to use that. He thinks the crust is the best thing ever. Me? I'm going to tell you a charcoal or wood grill. And I just for me, that's a better flavor, and I like the product better. But either way, we're going to agree that it's high heat. We're going to have to agree that you need a clean, well, you know, 
I want to say oiled surface or a clean surface that you're able to, you know, that the meat's not going to stick to. Those are probably some of the most important things. Of course, you know, a really good ground beef. And, and I, But these days, boy, we're all real lucky to be able to buy good ground beef pretty much anywhere. And then if you really want to get into it and you want to geek out, we tell you how to do it and grind your own. You could use short rib or skirt steak or both and really kind of come up with your own flavors. You know, there's this guy, I don't know if you heard of him, uh, Michael Simon. He has some restaurants here in Cleveland, but he refuses to come on this show. I have no idea why. (laughs) Big famous guy. And uh, he's got some burger joints around here called B-Spot, and they're very popular here. There's three of them here in uh, in the Cleveland metropolitan area. And he uses a mix of, I believe it's short rib meat and uh, brisket meat, and there's uh, there might be like a you know an Angus beef or some other you know something thrown in there, but it's a, a combination. He grinds it all uh, according to him every day in all these kitchens. For the people that, as you said, are looking to geek out and, and grind their <laughs> own, what kind of a uh, what's People want to geek out, but then they also don't want to lay out the cash for it. I mean, it's like the inherent American issue, right? So what what should you be looking to buy as far as a meat grinder? What kind of a cash layout is that going to be? Is buying the most expensive the best thing? How do you help set up a, a home guy who's looking to grind? Okay, so we're, we don't want to spend a lot of money, but we want to, we want to, um, we want to kind of maybe you know, make our own. So you, know, you can get... And they're kind of the old Italian style. You can find them used, or you can get them new for about $25, actually a hand grinder. Wow. That will grind meat. I old know school. I've seen them. Um, you know, I want to stress, and in our book we really do talk about it, it is important when grinding any kind of meat product that you are kind of following the directions, using your meat should be ice cold. I mean, your meat should be almost frozen. Your All your, your, your hopper, your... the um, everything part of that you can possibly keep really, really cold because you don't want bacteria to multiply. I'm not trying to scare anybody. I just want people to realize that it is a serious situation when you are grinding meat um, because if you heat it up, it does create bacteria. That's kind of my disclaimer. But you can get a good hand grinder probably for about $30. You know, go on up to, I have one at my house that I use that costs $200. You know, it works really well. You can grind more than meat. So, you know, if you're looking to make your own sausages, all these different um, attachments. Are, it's pretty cool stuff that you can get these days. You can even get a meat grinder for an attachment for your, um, you know, your stand mixer, a mixer that they have. Um, that's I don't I don't know sure how much they cost, but I don't think they're as expensive because it's really the motor that is the most expensive. If you have your stand mixer. Um, that that works pretty well. Yeah, I'm looking here online. I'm seeing uh, I'm seeing a heavy duty metal one for twenty two dollars. That yes. clips onto your bench. Very uh, very inexpensive. Yeah, absolutely. And and honestly, that's the old time way, right? Like an old Italian guy down in the north end of Boston. That's right. Grinding your own meat. Um, you know, there's always a lot of talk about meat safety. You kind of just referenced it. Uh, but you're talking about you know pre cooking it, making sure that you're not getting the bacteria in there while you're uh, grinding meat or handling it. When it comes to the internal finishing temperatures, can you shed a little real light on this subject and eliminate any old wives' tales that might be holding on to us? <laughs> well, these days, what we uh, what the, what the any health department is going to tell you is that children and older people uh, should be careful of bacteria. Should eat their meats well done. That would be my kind of disclaimer. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of eating it how you like. Um, we, you know, Chris and I will tell you medium rare. You know, he, he might like it a little more rare. That gives you, you know, if you're working with high-quality meats, buying from a reputable purveyor, or that's why I call purveyor for you, a reputable store, you know, you're going to be you're going to be good off. There's a lot of, um, you know, they're doing lots of testing, lots of cross-checking to make sure that you have the best product possible. If you're buying great-quality meat, then... You know, I believe a medium rare, a medium juicy, flavorful, absolutely delicious. Some people don't like that. If they want to cook a little more, that's okay with me too. But um, as far as wives' tales, you know, the problem is with uh, meat, and you know, this is from the day, you know, since the dawn of time. You know, there has been bacteria, there has been problems, and we need to recognize and be as safe as we possibly can. Andy Husband's joining us here on the show. We're talking about the new book, Wicked Good Burgers, that you can get. Uh, obviously, uh, somebody's uh, posted it here in the instant chat on Amazon.com. Uh, is it all in, the, is it all in the, the brick-and-mortar stores as well, all the Barnes and Nobles and whatnot? Absolutely. Every good book retailer will have this book. It's been selling great, too.
All right. Well, the, the sales numbers are always great. Obviously, it has to be doing uh, decent because you're working on that other third book, which we'll ask you about here in just a sec. Um, as far as you changing gears here a little bit off the book, uh, you do kind of participate in that IQ barbecue team as well. Um, do you have any uh, plans on getting out in the competition circuit this year? And, uh, you know, what are the goals for the team? Well, the team is, I don't want to worry anybody. The team is, we're all still best friends. But uh, Chris is competing more with his son and uh, his brother, and they're competing as heart attacks, spelled H-A-R-T. Um, you'll, so you'll see him competing around the circuit. You'll see, see me competing, I think, three times this year. I know I have slotted in my schedule, uh, New Hampshire, Vermont, and then I'll be out at the Kansas City Royal. Um, I'm not sure what team name I'm going to compete under. Uh, I'm still working on that, but... Um, We'll compete together at the Royal. We'll compete separately at different times. So we'll we'll be around. As far as our you know our our goals, our goals are the same as they've always been to win. The Memphis and May World Barbecue Championship Cookoff takes place this weekend. Is that something that you've uh, been able to take in and experience before? Uh, we've um, we've competed in a category or two. We've also been down there um, assisting. Um, uh, some of the uh, sponsors we've we've worked for the sponsors down there, but we've actually never really fully competed. You know, the um, Memphis and May is a different um, circuit than the ones that we usually compete in, which is the Kansas City, the KCBS, right? So it's a little bit different, and so it's a little foreign to us. Of course, we'd love the challenge, um, but we just haven't gotten there yet. You know, we've done the other big ones, of course, the uh, the Jack and the, the Royal, but not not the Memphis and May yet. Andy Husband's joining us here on the show. Uh, Andy, before I let you go, uh, you'd reference that you guys are already working on a third book. I mean, uh, is this going to come to a point where it's uh, author Andy Husband's, who also happens to be a chef, uh, with all these books that you and Chris are turning out here? And, uh, I mean, is that something that you would like to do? Would you like to kind of retire off the line and uh, and just be a, a cookbook author? Oh, boy. Um you know, I mean, I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I like to stay busy, otherwise I get in trouble. So uh, for me, uh, you know, I love working at the restaurant. I love working on the line, and I also love writing books. So I'm not sure there's an end of either one in sight. i got, I got a few more years on me. What's the new book about? Are you uh, able to divulge any type of information about yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, I can kind of give you a theory about it. All right. Um, I'm, I won't give you the title, but it's kind of um, – we one of the things that Chris and I are good at is taking a kind of a uh, so let's say because it's going to be about barbecues, taking barbecue but then taking it to another level. So it's not going to be as crazy with these really hard, complex recipes uh, as as uh, wicked good barbecue, but it's going to be a barbecue and backyard grilling book with some kind of creative um, recipes. So you know, we I guess my my example would be about wings. We've all had wings. We've all had barbecue wings. Yep. But then it's like, where can we take those? And so we're giving people ideas and recipes to be able to take things kind of beyond their backyard into a whole other stratosphere of awesome recipes. I got an instant chat here from uh, another uh, Boston guy. said, Wicked Good Food, the new Food Network show with hosts Andy Husbands and Chris Hart. What do you think? Are you guys ready to uh, take on the Food Network show or what? I would take that on, and then I'd retire. I have no problem with that. <laughs> there you go. No doubt about it. Uh, Andy Husbands. i say wicked good to that. Thank absolutely. You. Andy Husbands is the chef owner of Tremont 647 and Sister Sorrel, located in Boston, Massachusetts. You can pick up the new book, Wicked Good Burgers, uh, which he co-wrote with Chris Hart, Wicked Good Burgers, on Amazon.com, and, uh, of course, in all of your uh, typical brick-and-mortar book providers as well. Uh, Andy, always appreciate the time. Thanks for coming on tonight, buddy. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. You got it. There he is. The classy Andy Husbands. And, I mean, you know me. If you know this show, you know that my like for Andy Husbands is because he, oh man, it was had to have been four or five seasons ago. Uh, he was on Hell's Kitchen, and he was my favorite, uh, is it contestant on there, or personality, or reality TV item, or whatever. Um he was the best. He was always getting yelled at. Uh, everybody hate. Well, again, you know, I'm only watching the finished product. He was on and actually talked about it. It wasn't as bad as uh, it was making it out to be in the cut version. Uh, but when he was on, I mean, the people were railing on him all the time, and they were trying to get him voted off, and he was always undercooking chicken. Ain't nobody got time for that. 
And uh, he's since been on the show. I think this is like his fourth or fifth time. So always a great guest, uh, always bringing a lot of great info and insight. And this was uh, just another great interview that uh, he's allowed me to conduct with him. So I certainly appreciate the time that uh, he gives to the show. And we wish him nothing but the best of both him and Chris on Wicked Good Burgers. Go ahead, pick yourself off a cup. All right, quickly. Let me talk to you about the Barbecue Guru Gang. If you've been thinking about automatic pit temperature control devices for your cooks, then stop here. This is the company that has started it all. They are the creators of this technology. Uh, Why would you buy one from any other company? Uh, Not familiar with how these little beauties work? I'm not going to get into the minute details, but let me tell you something. What if I told you that you could get a device, set the pit temperature where you want it, and then boom, you're off to do whatever it is that you want to get done? Think this is out of line? Think this is crazy talk? You're crazy because this technology is available today. You can get it right now. If you're a busy working professional, maybe you're constantly on the run with kids doing errands, and quite frankly, you just don't have the time to set around and tend pit temperatures. The Barbecue Guru allows you to throw on a pork butt or a brisket or a couple slabs of ribs. You're off to do whatever it is you need to get done. And the Barbecue Guru maintains the pit temperature that you set it at. Currently, there's a number of different models to choose from. For instance, The CyberQ Wi-Fi gang. Is it just me, or are we living in uh, technology nirvana, right? You have smartphones, you have netbooks, you have laptops. If you have access to a wireless internet connection, you literally have the ability to sit there and monitor the temperature of your pit. Monitor up to three different meats in your pit. Oh, I'm cooking too fast. It's 3.30 in the morning. I don't want to go outside. Well, I'll just grab my smartphone. I'll make some pit temperature adjustments. I'll ramp it back down. If I'm cooking too fast, maybe I'm not cooking fast enough. I need to bump that up a little bit. Watch out. You can do it all from the comfort of your smart devices. CyberQ Wi-Fi. If you've got Wi-Fi, you have CyberQ Wi-Fi capability. Uh, Maybe you want something that's just more of a cruise control for uh, pit temperature. The Party Q has you covered right there at $129 for most cookers. The Party Q, easiest point of entry for pit temperature control devices. Don't forget, they also sell the Onyx Oven that has been winning on competition circuits for any number of years. Also in the backyard, you visit the website, thebbqguru.com, or you check them out with the telephone, 800-288-GURU. That's 800-288-GURU. They will make sure you are outfitted with exactly what you need to get you up and running right out of the box. TheBBQGuru.com, 800-288-GURU. The Barbecue Guru is a breakthrough in barbecue technology. All right. Get this microphone fixed. Uh, We will be joined by Bruce Pryor right after this to talk about the Barbecue Dragon. The what? Barbecue Dragon. Stick around. We'll be right back. Big name interviews, advice on cooking brisket and ribs, and the only host willing to share his honest opinion on all things important in the world of barbecue, it's the Barbecue Central Show. All right, we are back. 877-448-0433. You can also email the show, greg at thebbqcentralshow.com. Uh, My next guest has a new product on the market for your review. Centralized, uh, do you cook with charcoal? Do you think it takes entirely too long to start? What if I told you you could be ready to grill in as little as 10 minutes? You might have an interest in what my next guest is about to say. Let's go ahead and race over to the hotline. And welcome in first timer to the show, Bruce Pryor. Bruce, how are you? Hello. How's it going? It's going great. How are you doing? I'm doing absolutely fantastic, Bruce. Appreciate you uh, making time for the show. Uh, I just want, I forgot to tell you about this when you're looking at it. Like you'll be able to see me, and sometimes when I just put you on camera, like I'm going to do, like right now, uh, then you're only going to be looking back at yourself. So don't get freaked out. Okay. All right. I don't. I see a picture of you. Now you do. Well, no, I don't see a picture of you. Actually, live you. I just see a uh, a drawing of you with the grill. Oh, here you go. Sorry. 
That's okay. Now you can be totally invested in my complete ugliness. This is great. Okay. All right, uh, Bruce Pryor joining us here on the show. Um, before we get into the barbecue dragon, Bruce, maybe a little bit of background on you and kind of how you tie into the barbecue and grilling game. Uh, well, I'm uh, I guess a backyard griller, man. I've been I've been grilling and smoking stuff uh, for years. Um, actually the, you know, the barbecue dragon is a, a product of both my, my brother and I, we've been working on the thing together and he's the same way for, for years. We've been, uh, you know, comparing rib recipes and smoking stuff in the, in the afternoons and on weekends and football games and comparing notes, you know, how did yours come out? Uh, how'd you do this? And, uh, whenever we get together for, for family events and whatnot, um, we're the guys who always, who always go out and uh, do the cooking and grill the steaks and do all that kind of stuff. So basically uh, years of just enjoying uh, the barbecue pastime. I assume that you had, uh, obviously, an affinity for the charcoal grill, maybe a little bit more than the gas, uh, the gas grills that are out there. Is that a, a safe assumption to make? Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, I do have a gas grill, and I, uh, I use it in a pinch. Um, but yeah, I love the, the, the charcoal, you know, the, uh, whatever, just, just spending weekends. Well, obviously, you know, you can't really, uh, do any good, any good meat smoking without, uh, charcoal. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, the 4th of July, what's this, what's the smell you like to smell, right? It's, uh, people firing up their charcoal grills and cooking meat over, uh, over charcoal, in my opinion. So, so yeah, definitely, uh, definitely a charcoal guy all, all the way. Bruce Pryor joining us here on the show, uh, creator of the Barbecue Dragon. You can check the website out, bbqdragon.com, if you want to peruse that here while we're talking. Uh, Bruce, when did the concept of Barbecue Dragon get in your head, or both you and your brother said, and what kind of a process was it to get this thing going? Well, I'll tell you what, I can remember exactly the the day. My So my brother was over, he, he lives in Los Angeles, and I'm out in uh, in Denver, and he was over three years ago and it was uh, early spring we were at my house and uh, it was sort of a drizzly day. And, and again, we'd been uh, charged with, uh, we, we, we need to go out and start doing all the cooking. And uh, of course we, we uh, usually volunteer for that. So we're out in, in the backyard, it's drizzling. We're trying to get the coals going. Probably the bag of charcoal had been getting rained on for, uh, for half a day or something. And uh, you can imagine the luck we were having. And uh, eventually I dragged my wife's hair dryer, like I think a lot of guys do, dragged my wife's hair dryer out into the, uh, into the rain. So we're standing there in the rain with the hair dryer, blowing on the thing, trying to get the coals going. And, and uh, it was then we, uh, we uh, spent most of the rest of the afternoon uh, over drinking beers, figuring out uh, exactly how we ought to go about solving this problem. And I'll tell you what, man, it was standing there holding the hair dryer. We're thinking, oh, this is, uh, you know, we've solved it. How, you know, of course, somebody else must have come up with something like this, and this is going to be easy. And, uh, and here we are three years later, and uh, we finally got the thing dialed in just the way it ought to be. It was actually a lot more development than, than either one of us had ever anticipated. All right, so here's what I would like to do. I'm going to go ahead, at least for the video side, of people, I'm going to flash some pictures of it in case they're not going over to the uh, bbqdragon.com website. Uh, but if you could kind of explain uh, how it works and what some of the features of the barbecue dragon are. Yeah. Hey, am I supposed to be seeing you? Because I see, I see me, and I see the little uh, window thing scrolling and refreshing. It's fine. I just don't yeah, know. No, you don't need to worry about seeing me at all. Okay. Uh, so let me. I have one here. Oh, perfect. Show you. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. So our, our, uh, a little bit of the background. We started off, like I said, with a, uh, with a hair dryer. And what we have now is actually a, a, a much more sophisticated device than, than you might imagine. Now, you know, you can see here fan. There's a, a flexible neck here. And we got this special clip that we have a lot of work into uh, designing so it holds on the grill. But, but the idea is you, you clip the thing on your grill and you adjust it where you like and turn it on and you can hear the thing running there. And uh, so, you know, technically to, to talk about the thing, we have a, a really, you know, the, the challenge, we, it's, it's battery powered. And, uh, you know, we didn't want a, a device where you got to drag a cord out on the grill 
or out on your porch and uh, you know you're you're trying to find the extension cord and plug the thing in it had to be battery powered and that was that was really the first problem we ran into we needed a good fan and a good motor that would that would last a long time and uh run on batteries and that was uh that was a pretty pretty tough problem to solve but so so basically what we have right now are pretty high tech uh helicopter like model airplane and uh helicopter parts um that are that are that were the uh, the basis for the fan and stuff that we're using and then uh and then with this clip right here we also wanted this thing to be really versatile and i don't know can you see that yep see that pretty well so this thing holds on in in this position really tight on the side of a you know we were using a weber grill for all of our for all of our demos but it also opens up really wide that comes uh, about two inches wide open and we wanted to be able to use the thing for all kinds of stuff that was one of our one of our goals we wanted to be able to use it on your grill um on the smoker on the uh the fire pit in the backyard you know i take the thing with me camp and i've been using it obviously for the last few years while we're developing it so i take my kids up camping and i set it on the ground and it'll sit on the ground sort of in this position and it'll just sit there by itself and it blows on the campfire up there so the point is we wanted to be super versatile so there was a lot of a lot of messing around with the, the shape of that handle and getting that neck position just right and uh, getting the weight of the batteries and all that kind of stuff positioned so that, so that it all works. And then, and then keeping it heat resistant, right? You don't want to go grab this thing off the grill and burn your hand and uh, melt the fan. There's, you know, this thing always stays cool because we're, we're blowing air in. So anyway, I'm starting to ramble. There's there's a there's a lot of features here that I could spend some time talking about. Is that like a, an ABS plastic or a special a fire retardant plastic? What do you have that on that handle? Well, we, got a, we have a variety of things here on the front. This part is metal. This is the part that's going to be you know sticking right inside of your grill here. And so this part is is metal, and uh, we have we have some pads in here that I think you can probably see. Yep. And those are silicone, so that's a high temperature silicone, so that. When, that, when that's on your grill and it's mounted, uh, you know, the, the way it's going to be, that'll get hot, but it's not going to melt those pads. So the rest is metal. And then all this part, which sits outside of your grill, is uh, is plastic. And then there's a high temperature uh, plastic, which is uh, these components in the uh, in the fan housing there. And, and the fan housing, I want to point out here, is uh, stainless steel. I've left this thing out over the last, especially last winter when I was testing these uh, these final models. I left it out in the snow accidentally multiple times, and uh, the thing, <laughs> although it's not designed for it, it uh, we wanted the thing to be able to sit out there because, of course, that's going to happen in, in real use. Bruce Pryor joining us here on the show. We're talking about uh, his creation, the Barbecue Dragon, bbqdragon.com is the website. Uh, do you have, like, a projected price point on this bad boy? Well, right now we're uh, we're selling them. Uh, so we're we're doing a Kickstarter campaign. We're selling them on there for uh, for forty two bucks and free shipping. And then uh, when at, on our first initial production runs, they're uh, they're forty nine. And uh, like anything else, we'd like to get to the point where we're producing them in large enough numbers we could get them down to uh, like thirty nine bucks. But so far, you know, when people see these things work, we've had we've had very few people who complain about the price. I mean, you think. You can go to uh, most hardware stores and, and buy a, uh, I think Weber is selling their high end chimney for thirty bucks. So this thing's only twenty bucks more, and it does a lot, does a lot more stuff. So some naysayer would say, of course, that well, you know, the barbecue dragon doesn't hold charcoal. You're going to potentially need the charcoal chimney anyway, uh, or you're going to be building it in the grill. Which it seems like a lot of people have just gotten away from building charcoal pyramids in the grill because of that advent of the charcoal chimney. And then yeah. you have some other competing products uh, like this uh, thing called the Phi Air, which I guess is somewhere in between uh, bigger than a pen, uh, smaller than a hair dryer. Um, and then uh, I have a thing called a Luft lighter, which is from Sweden initially. This is a little bit different. It's a plug-in for sure, so not as mobile. Um, but it does uh, provide a stream of air and it lights, so a little bit different from the Barbecue Dragon. As far as competing products, is anybody kind of on your level or do you think yours is really kind of a, a separate being altogether? You know, I think it's a, a separate deal altogether. And, and actually, I think you can use all of the things... You know, I, I would I would say everything but the chimney you can actually use uh, with a barbecue dragon. So your your loof lighter, for example, you can uh, you can drag that thing out and light a few of the coals. But if you don't want to stand there 
lighten the, the thing the whole time. Like if you want to get your coals going, you know, in 10 or 15 minutes or something, you have to stand there with your loof lighter the whole time. So you could get a few of the coals started that way and then clip a dragon on your grill and it'll do the rest of it while you go inside and, uh, you know, fix your burgers or whatever you're getting ready to do. So, you know, it works in combination with that. And, and with the chimney, um, you know, a lot of people ask, hey, can I use this with my chimney? They, they uh, like exactly like you're saying, they like the chimney. So you certainly could, but we've, we've actually done a lot of testing for exactly that reason and uh, found that it's, it's actually about twice as fast to uh, just ditch the chimney altogether and uh, only use a dragon. Now, you mentioned this is a Kickstarter. I'm not, uh, I guess, up on my Kickstarter do's and don'ts, uh, but evidently, okay. you know, you're looking to raise a certain amount of money. So uh, let's say it's a billion dollars. Well, how much are you looking to raise? Uh, we're on Kickstarter hoping to raise a hundred grand. All right, so let's say uh, that this time elapses and you're shy by fifteen grand. Now, of course, I'm going to stroke you the fifteen thousand dollars to get you there. But if you yeah. didn't have me, like, what would happen? Is it everybody screwed, game over, or what? Well, uh, I would like to say no, but officially for Kickstarter, um, yes. If we don't, if we don't reach that hundred thousand dollar goal, then we don't fund none of none of we don't get any of that money. Oh. Um, the the way Kickstarter set up is actually if you if you go there and you um, and you make a pledge, they call it. Um, they don't actually charge you for the pledge until the end, until the Kickstarter thing's over, and only if we reach that goal. So actually, nobody who has made us any pledges yet has been charged for anything. And if we don't ever hit that goal, no one ever gets charged. So, so exactly, I'll be calling you in uh, in a couple of weeks for that fifteen grand if we're not there. So, you know, I'm sure you're uh, got contingency plans out the ass. What happens if you don't make the the hundred grand goal on Kickstarter? Where do you go from there? You know, it's probably the, the worst thing that's going to happen is it's probably going to delay us a little while. You know, the main the main reason that we're trying to go on Kickstarter is is because we want to make more of these than than we would normally be able to. So, um, you know, we, we took this thing to uh, the the hearth patio and barbecue show out in Orlando, Florida, uh-huh. a couple of months ago. Yep. And and that was literally when we first launched the thing. We've been being super quiet about it because. You know, obviously we're biased. We've been working on the thing and using it the last couple of years, and, and we love it. It works great. I mean, I really, I, I obviously having invented the thing, um, I, I want to sell it. But aside from that, it really does work great. I really enjoy using it. It's a fun tool. So, so we took the thing to HPBA, and people loved it. I mean, literally for three days, we had people coming up wanting to get involved, wanting to, you know, that was a lot of retailers and distributors wanting to carry it in their stores and their, their patio stores and their barbecue stores and yep. stuff. So we came back from that realizing, wow, we need to make a lot more of these things than, than we can. And that's why we're on Kickstarter. So if, if we fail there, then, then yeah, we're looking at other sources of funding and, you know, in order to get these, these large volumes. And then of course, like, like any other product, the more we can make, the cheaper they are. Right. So so uh, it helps us if we can uh, produce larger numbers of these things. We can get them for for cheaper from the factories and uh, get them out to people for less money. Hopefully, ultimately. You ever thought about like a Shark Tank, or something like that? Yeah, yeah. It's funny you ask. Everybody asks us that as soon as they see it. People love it, and they're like, "Oh, you guys got to go on Shark Tank." And uh, I think it'd be great for exposure. But having watched the show a few times, those guys they are sharks. They they want a big chunk of the of the business, you know, more than, than we're, uh, willing to give away. So, uh, you know, it might be worth going on there for the exposure, but yeah, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to give away 40% of the company or something like that, whatever those guys want. All right. So ditching off shark tank, what about this? If uh, Kingsford or Charbroil approached you and said, Bruce, love the idea. Uh, we would love, to, we see the value added here, and we just want to add this to our products portfolio along with our charcoal. Would you be open to an outright sell of uh, this unit, all the intellectual property? Would you uh, Would you take a buy from that? Well, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd put it this way. I would not say no. I would, uh, I'd want to sit down and chat with them, see how serious they are. You know, who, I, who knows, right? It's early in the game, but who knows? What's the, what's the potential that... Uh, in other words, what are they going to offer? Right, cut to the chase. All right, sure, I'll talk to you about selling. What's what are you going to pay me for? All right. right? So, as the great wrestler Ric Flair, oh, wait, Ted DiBiase said, everybody has a price. You know what that number is. Well, what's the number for me to buy it from you right now? There's a number you got right now. 
Boy, that is a toughie. Well, here let's put it in. Uh, let's put it in George Foreman grill terms. The way I understand, that guy sold like fifty million of his George Foreman grills over the years, selling them on uh, whatever his infomercials and stuff. Right? Everybody's yeah. seen those. You can buy those things all over. And I believe that he just sold his company or something for like a well over a hundred million dollars. So. The day Kingsford comes to me with those kind of that that kind of stuff, I'll be uh, those kind of numbers. I'll be listening. Hundred million dollars. <laughs> what if the Barbecue yeah, Central I mean, Radio Show? No idea. I'm I'm new to this. I have no idea what's a little what's a little company like us worth, right? We think we can sell a lot of these, and and uh, probably over the years we can make a lot of money. So, you know, I, I don't know. All right. Well, there he is, uh, Bruce Pryor, the creator or one of the creators of the Barbecue Dragon. Uh, depending on how Kickstarter goes, it may or, or may not be here sooner than later. But uh, obviously, if you go to bbqdragon.com, you can check out all the progress and uh, see how it's going there. Bruce, appreciate the time. I wish you nothing but the best. Uh, obviously, fellow Buckeye, and you know, I don't want to share the story that we shared with each other on email. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah. uh, you know, we're, we're really pulling for you, and hopefully these things worked out for you. Hey, man, I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me on. And uh yeah, follow us and uh, be waiting. Be waiting by your phone for that call there. Uh, I got the uh, checkbook ready and I got bags of cash ready to to write that for you. Yeah, that's what I've heard about you. Perfect. <laughs> All right, Bruce, take care. Thanks a lot, man. See ya. There he is, Bruce Pryor. Yeah, if he's heard that I got uh, bags of cash, my man is sorely mistaken. Do you like this one? Do you like this one? Ain't nobody got time for this. Like this one? You like this one. Ain't nobody got time for that. You tell me. Is Austin Carr Mr. Cavalier breathing his last breath and Sweet Brown ready to take over? Only you can tell. All right, guys. I'm going to talk to you about uh, Stephen DeFranco here right now before we close out the show. Let me tell you something. I was at Stephen DeFranco's place uh, on Saturday. And... um, Look, I've learned my lesson. I go right to Steve when we have, whenever we have a birthdays, anniversaries, Mother's Day, uh, Valentine's Day, all that stuff. You know, I don't even bother trying to get into the doghouse. I have uh, kept myself out of it for years now, especially uh, since he started sponsoring the show and giving everybody these uh, crazy hookups. And a lot of you have done business with Steve, but I'm telling you right now, if you screwed up over the weekend, if you screwed up over the weekend, you forgot, you did something stupid, you went out with the boys and got shit face drunk, threw up on Mother's Day and all that terrible stuff. Get that stuff out of here. Do it right. It's not too late to make events. Visit stephendefranco.com. D-I-F-R-A-N-C-O. stephendefranco.com. That's first and foremost. Peruse the inventory, see what he's got. Then give him a call. 440-943-2700. That's 440 440- 943 2700. And when you do that, ask for Steve. Say, hey, Steve, listen to uh, Rempy all the time on this Barbecue Central radio show. He's always telling me that I need to call in. Uh, I screwed up on Mother's Day. I need your help. What do you suggest? He will ask a myriad of questions to really drill down to the core issues, drilling down in sales terms. But he will drill down to the core issues of what you're looking to accomplish, where your budget is. Uh, what kind of an impression you're looking to make? Are you never getting laid again? Did you screw up that bad? He'll be able to figure all that out and then help you on your merry way. And don't forget, like with the watches, you get the second year of warranty for free that nobody else is going to give you. You get batteries for life. He'll set the time for you. He'll engrave it for free. Everything that you buy, uh, watches, necklaces, uh, earrings, whatever, it all ships for free. Value added all over the place. 440-943-2700. 440-943-2700. And then ask for Steve once somebody answers the phone. Don't talk to, you know, Linda or Judy or Mike. Ask for Steve. He owns it. Ask for the barbecue brother or sister hookup, and you are off and running. And moms uh, and ladies, don't forget, uh, Father's Day is coming up next month. Get on the ball right now. Call Steve. I'm sure Steve will be running some type of like a 50% off uh, Accutron watch deal coming up. They were running that for Mother's Day as well. You can hook your husband up with a fat watch because he's a great guy making great barbecue and grilling mess. All right, uh, we'll close the show out here quickly. Stick around. We'll be right back.
Broadcasting live from the Barbecue Central Radio Network Studios in Cleveland, Ohio. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Radio Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rampey. All right, we are back. 877-448-0433. Greg at the BBQCentralShow.com. Thanks again to Bruce Pryor for talking about the Barbecue Dragon. Uh, I think a lot of people were kind of pulling for this guy, looking to make a name for himself. I think if I gave that guy $2 million, my man is out of uh, is out of making Barbecue Dragon. That's what I think. He knows the number. You know the number. You want to buy this radio show? I know the number. $25 billion. This thing is a revenue generator. You can't step to me. Forget cubes. I'm the Mark Cuban of barbecue. All right. Uh, Let's go ahead and press off. This is Chris Payne. Oh, yeah, right. Oh, I forgot about the second hour. All right. Running, well, well, we're not running over yet, but we will be in about three seconds. All right, let's wrap it up. Uh, In the first hour, you would recall, we talked with Melissa Cookston, Yazoo's Delta Q, going for their second win in a row, Memphis in May, third in the last four years, fourth hog win in a row. So lots of... Streaks on the line. We wish her nothing but the best. Always appreciate the uh, the time that she comes on. Here's what I really appreciate about her. It's fact, you know, no nonsense. Humble beginnings, hard work. This is what we're going to do. So is she giving herself not a shot at winning? Probably. But that's what you're taking away from the conversation uh, around 914 earlier uh, this evening. I'm not going to dissuade you from that. I would say that with experience, with winning, breeds experience in winning. We'll probably look to have her back on next week. Also, we talked to Harry DeHorse about the upcoming Preakness this weekend. Uh, Orb, Oxbow, and My Loot. Those are your horses to bet on. Also, in the second hour, Andy Husbands, Tremont647.com, FearlessChef.com. Buy Wicked Good Burgers. You'll be happy that you did. And uh, closing up the show, Bruce Pryor. Again, BBQDragon.com. BBQ Dragon. Fund it. Back it. Save me 15 grand. You'll be happy that you did. All right. Uh, if you use raw cast iron, do me a favor. Season it each and every time. A little high heat. Hit the grill brush. A little pan. A little Crisco to let it burn back in. Keep it seasoned for generations of rust free service. And last but not least, September 11, 2001. I will never forget. Until next Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, this is your program host and proud U.S. American, Greg Rempe. Good night now.